It's hard to imagine today, but there was a time when Russia considered itself part of Western Europe and wanted to be part of NATO. In the early years of President Vladimir Putin's presidency, he invited the then NATO Secretary General to Moscow to lay the groundwork. So what went wrong and how should the West move forward? I'm Linda Nusifora and I'm sitting down with the former NATO boss, Lord George Robertson, one on one. Lord George Robertson, thank you so much for making time to speak to us here on TRT World. It's a pleasure to be here. Let's begin with the obvious topic, given your background. You were the NATO Secretary General between 1999 and 2003. During this time, quite a new unknown leader was on the world stage, Vladimir Putin. And at that time, he showed quite an interest in integrating Russia with the West and NATO. What has changed and why are we seeing such a dramatic reversal in that stance now? I keep asking me, my, myself that question because I got along extremely well with, uh, with President Putin. Uh, we established a good relationship um, between NATO and Russia and between myself and uh, President Putin. We established in 2002 on the 28th of May the NATO-Russia Council with 20 countries round the table, including President Putin that day in Rome. Uh, we created a whole series of working groups that came out of the NATO-Russia Council, looking at a whole range of subjects, you know, from medical uh, uh, defence issues right through to nuclear strategy uh, as well. So we were working closely at that time. So, but Where since did then, the cooperation break down, do you think? I think he started to get delusions. I think he started to believe that Russia could be great again. He wanted Russia to be seen as the Soviet Union was, as the second superpower in the world, although it clearly wasn't. He wanted equality with the United States, which he was never going to get. Um, and I think that diverged him then from the idea of equality around the NATO table to equality only with the United States of America. And I think, you know, the, ex the experience with Georgia and, and gradually staying too long in the job persuaded himself that, that he was greater, his country was greater than it had any right to be. How disappointing is it when you see the current state of NATO's relationship with Russia, given where it could have been when you were visualising that partnership back in the early 2000s? Well, I'm not just disappointed. I'm, I'm really very cut up about it because the person that I did business with, seemed to get on well with, and who seemed to have a, a common understanding of the problems in the world and how we could together deal with them, has now turned into this megalomaniac who is deliberately trying to destroy uh, an, an, in, an independent nation state. I, I stood with him that day in Rome, uh, about as far apart as we are today and heard him saying, Ukraine is a sovereign, independent nation state which will make its own decisions about its security future. Now he wants to kill Ukraine, destroy Ukraine. Now, so that's not just a disappointment, it's a, a catastrophic change of attitude, which I think has upset the whole world order that we've grown used to. You've had, during your time as the NATO boss, nine high-level meetings, and as you say, sometimes very close one-on-one -on -one with Vladimir Putin. You perhaps know his sense of strategy maybe better than most. How do you think the West can engage or re-engage with him to get Russia back at the negotiating table, as Turkey has been trying to do, especially with regards to Ukraine? Well, I knew him then, and he was a very different person then. And he's been isolated now from any normality, from any normal uh, human beings. There's no real interaction getting close to him at all. And the pandemic uh, and the virus has had a very serious effect on him, almost hiding away and sort of stewing up in his own mind some delusion about Russia's nature uh, of, of its place in the, uh, in the world. The question, good question is, what 
do we do now? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, we have to defeat him. You know, he's invaded you know, a, 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 an unaggressive, unprovoked, he's attacked Ukraine and wants to basically eliminate it as a nation state. So we have got to beat them. That's the very first thing we have to do. Then maybe we can reach out to uh, the people of Russia who don't seem to be involved in this at all at the moment to say Russia still has a place in the world, but not if it is going to act like this to close neighbours and to other independent countries. And Turkey's stance is that the way to peace is through dialogue and through diplomacy. Do you believe that this war can be ended through diplomacy and dialogue? It can't be ended by diplomacy in the short term. As one of my successors said, if Russia stops fighting, there will be peace. If Ukraine stops fighting, there will be no Ukraine. That's the reality of the situation now. But yes, there will be a place for diplomacy in the future. Yes, there will be an opportunity for talking. And I, I very much welcome President Erdogan's role in, in acting in a way as an intermediary, for, for example, over the grain ships. That was a very important and significant uh, breakthrough uh, that took place at this time. But, you know, as long as President Putin is going to continue with this invasion and with the bombardment of civilian targets and the, the breaking of international humanitarian law, then, you know, there isn't much of a place for diplomacy yet. There will be eventually. Moving slightly away from Russia, but staying with NATO, how would you assess NATO's cooperation at the moment. There are obviously tensions between some NATO allies. How do you broadly see the alliance at the moment? Well, we've, all, we've always had tensions between NATO allies. You know, we're, we're talking here of 30 independent democracies with a common aim of common defence, but they're all separate. That, that's 30 electorates. It's so you don't see government. tensions between NATO allies as being detrimental to the alliance itself. It's part of the normality. You know, we're not the Warsaw Pact. In the Warsaw Pact days, Russia said, and everybody else jumped. Yeah, it doesn't apply in NATO. You've got countries like the United States of America, France and the UK, but you've also got Luxembourg and Iceland, tiny, small countries as well, all round that self same table, interested in collective defence, common defence. And that's what, what unites them. But you're never going to get total unanimity or uniformity of view within, within inside NATO. But every security challenge thrown at NATO over the years has been resolved. One way or another, we have, we have resolved that. And I think that's what's going to happen in the future. And I hope the present you know, difference of opinion that exists between President Erdogan and the government of, of Sweden will be resolved because, it, because it's absolutely essential that Sweden and Finland become full members of NATO, an absolute imperative for the alliance and for the security of its members. Why? Why do you think NATO enlargement is so important? The, NATO's enlargement is to do with democracies thin, bending themselves together, giving up an element, a crucial area of sovereignty in order to have that collective defence and the more countries that are involved in it the better it will be and Finland and Sweden are already very close to NATO collaborating in Afghanistan collaborating in the Balkans uh, and you know NATO would be much stronger with them in it and all of the members of NATO including Turkey would be stronger having them in the alliance. Do you see the alliance expanding beyond Finland and Sweden? Well I don't I, I wouldn't like to make any prophecies about the future. There are Balkan countries that uh, may well eventually decide to join. Uh, and who knows, eventually in the future, maybe we'll see uh, Russia uh, becoming part of, a, of an organisation that is broader than the present moment. It's inconceivable mm -hmm. with Vladimir Putin. But he once asked me, when are you going to invite uh, Russia to join NATO? And I told him, we don't invite countries to join NATO. They apply to join NATO. So, so people who talk about NATO expansion as if it was some sort of giant crab-like organisation are wrong. Na countries apply to join NATO and then they have to conform to the standards that we expect of, of NATO countries 
So who knows in the future who else is going to apply, but I don't see it limited to the existing membership. If we can turn our attentions away from NATO and you can uh, put on your uh, former Labour um, politician hat for us, uh, how would you describe the current state of UK politics? It's chaotic. Um, it's not easy to describe it other than that. I find it. I've been in Poland. I've been in Parliament now for 44 years, and I've never seen anything as ridiculous as this. We've had six education ministers in the UK since July, you know, and we've had a number of prime ministers, chancellors, and the rest of it. You know, that that's that's uh, giving banana republics a bit of a bad name. Hopefully, there's a degree of stability now. And we'll have an election in two years' time when, when I'm pretty confident as a partisan politician, but as somebody who has been involved, that we'll see a, a change of government at that time. And I think then Britain will be able to hell, hold its head higher than just now. Elections aside, as you say, it's two years away. That's quite a while. Um, do you think current Prime Minister Rishi Sunak can unite the country around a common goal for the next two years? It doesn't look as though the new Prime Minister is going to be able to unite his party, never mind the nation. Um, you know, but let, let's, let's give him a chance. You know, I'm a patriotic uh, Briton. Um, you know, but I, but I want to see a change of government. I don't believe that the Conservatives at the moment can offer the, the, the unity and sense of purpose that my country should be applying, especially in the world today. Um, so we'll see how he gets on. He's got a budget next week. Uh, he's got a, a horrendous economic problem, largely created by his predecessor uh, to deal with. Um, and he's got some other nightmare issues, as well as rallying our country behind the Ukrainians and their uh, bid to stay alive and to continue to exist as a country. Just one final question. Uh, you're a former defence minister yourself. How do you see, uh, it, obviously, Ukraine aside, but the, the current state of security globally? The Europeans are have had a wake-up call. They've always known that they needed to do more in their own defence, that they could not, especially under President Trump, rely on the United States to always come to their rescue. Now, with what has happened in Ukraine, they realise that they've got a really serious problem so close to home. So much more is going to have to be done by the European nations in their own common defence. And the more they do for defence, the stronger NATO will become because NATO benefits from the European capabilities. So it, it's taken a rude awakening, uh, but I believe that Europe is now going to uh, be able and, and be forced into doing what it should have done quite a long time ago. Lord George Robertson, thank you so much for your time here on TRT World. Pleasure to be with you.